Hello and welcome to the Westfield Matildas podcast, the podcast where you get to know more about the people behind the team voted Australia's most beloved. I'm your host, Anne O'Dong, and on this week's episode, we have Matilda's cap number 179, a player who has represented Australia 46 times, scoring six goals, including at the 2014 and 2018 AFC Women's Asian Cup and the 2015 and 2019 FIFA Women's World Cup. Welcome to the podcast, Hayley Razzo. Thanks for having me. Hayley, where are you right now? I am currently in my house in Australia. How did that come about that you ended up in Australia? Because the last time we were catching up, you were just about to jet your way to England to hook up with Everton. Yeah, that's correct. I flew over to Everton um, and the day I was supposed to go in and meet the team and start training, everything went into lockdown because of the coronavirus. So... As a club, Everton decided to send their internationals home uh, just to prevent anybody getting stuck in in the country as they weren't sure what was going to happen with with all the lockdowns in in different countries. So they flew me back to Australia with the league being postponed for a while as, as far as we know for now. And I am currently in isolation for 14 days in my house. It's It's been amazing how quickly, well, not even amazing, just like, just really interesting how quickly everything has changed in all our worlds in a really short period of time. Less than two weeks ago, the Matildas were looking to qualify for the Tokyo 2020 Olympics and you're getting ready to hopefully, you know, kick off your career in the FAWSL and before you know it, you're back home and the world's changed. I know, it's it's really quite crazy and I don't think anybody could have really imagined it would pan out this way. You know, I was supposed to go to to Everton in January and ended up not being able to go and went into camp and then was supposed to go after the Matildas game and broke my nose, um, had to have the operation. And then finally, third time lucky, I went over there and everything just got called off. So I was really looking forward to getting over there and playing. But I guess like everyone's saying, it's, it's, it's important to look after the health of everybody and kind of just taking each day as it comes. There seems to always be some new development um, around the world each day. So hopefully things can get back to normal soon. How great have Everton been? As you said, you know, you you were getting ready to fly out at 3am the next morning after the first phase of the Olympic qualifiers. And then you found out you got a broken nose and then you actually arrive after the playoff rounds and then everything hits. Everton have been absolutely amazing I actually was quite shocked at how how well they looked after me and and how understanding they've been when I broke my nose I spoke with with the manager with the coach and they said to me you need to look after yourself and if this is what you need to do um, have the operation and and obviously fix your nose straighten your nose back up then that's what you need to do and said they'll be there and waiting for when I can come over so Um, That was amazing of them. And then same with the coronavirus situation. They kind of put all their players first and the welfare of the players and sent everybody home so they could be with their families and be in their home countries in case anything worse happened. And so all of the internationals at the club, obviously all the players in England too, have gone home and, and we're just managing the situation. But I feel really cared for and really understood and it's, it's nice to be at a team that is so supportive. I mean, that kind of attitude, it must build, like, even before you've kicked a ball with them, it must build, like, a sense of loyalty that this club is caring about you, the person, first, and then the footballer, second. Yeah, definitely. Like I said, I feel really supported and I haven't actually met most of the team. I haven't met a lot of the staff, um, but I do feel I do feel a loyalty to them and I do feel that this is the place for me. I... I honestly just want to get over there now and play and meet everybody. And I know that that circumstance can't happen, but I'm just really looking forward to the day that 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 does happen and I can finally be there, meet the team, meet the rest of the staff and know that, you know, this is where I'm meant to be. We'll get to how everything came about in you connecting with Everton, the Team Cahill connection, because that's a friendship that we've seen build over on social media. But as you said, you're able to 
have isolation at home with your family. For you in particular as a player, how important is it to to be able to be home and in home comforts, to be able to be with people as the world changes around us? I think it's really important. As much as I was really excited to to be over in the UK, I felt quite alone. People from my team that I lived with had gone home to their their family and friends because obviously they're in Europe and they live close and I was in this new country in a new house by myself and it was interesting. I had Chloe Legazzo uh, drive up from Bristol and spend some time with me and that made me feel quite at home. We just lived together like we do at Matilda's camp because we're roommates and, and that was really nice and comforting but then you know, obviously that would have to come to an end at some point and I just would have been there and by myself. So for me to come home, be in the comforts of my own home, with my family in uncertain times, I think it's it's important and um, I feel good knowing that I'm here for as long as this whole situation takes place and then when things get back up and running again, I'll be back over there to actually start my time at Everton like I should have from the beginning. <laughs> I mean, how amazing was that that Chloe made the drive up? It really does speak to the bond that you guys have as a playing group because it's very easy to to be in your own thoughts, in your own minds, and then it, it takes another level, I guess, to be able to go out and then support somebody else and do that because you just care about them as a person. I think, you know, there's the physical part of it where you're not training and it's, it's our job and we're not running around and doing the thing we love. But then there's also the mental part of it too where you, I guess, are in another country away from your family and you feel alone. So to have a friend and to have somebody care enough to come up and see you and spend time with you was amazing. You know, I had somebody to go for a run with. I had somebody to eat dinner with. I had somebody to play cards with just to keep the time ticking over. So it was really nice and I think I would have done the same for her and as a team, the Matildas, I think we'd all do the same for each other because we all share such a close bond and such a great friendship. It was really interesting um, that you guys managed to find a coffee shop. Is that a thing? Is that the first thing you guys ever do when you're in a country is check out the coffee shop? It actually is. It's it's quite <laughs> funny, but not just me, not just Chloe, literally everybody. It's wherever we go, the girls are looking on their phones, looking on Instagram, <laughs> looking online, trying to find where it has good coffee and no matter what country and that's what we're doing. And to be honest, there are a few girls who are good at finding spots and, and, and we ask them and that's where we end up going for the whole time we're in camp. So I think actually even Ante is aware of it and he makes sure that wherever we have camp, whatever hotel we're staying in, that we do have a place to get our coffee. To be fair, I feel like that's kind of in the coaching staff's best interest, so they kind of do that anyway. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. Uh, every time we go for coffee, they're, they're in the cafe too having a coffee, so it works for everybody, I think. Explain to us this Matilda's coffee culture. Where did it come from? Because honestly, Instagram stories, that is the first thing <laughs> you pretty much see when you guys have landed anywhere. I actually don't know. I think we're all just a little bit addicted. I think it's nice because we're in camp, we're around each other 24-7 and we're just training. So when we have that downtime, it's nice to be able to go sit in a cafe, have a coffee, chat to your friends, play cards um, and just get out of the hotel for a while. I feel like I see a thousand Instagram accounts all starting to be internet detectives about where you guys are going to go next for coffee. (laughs) I think that might be the case. Going back to Everton and going back to England, how did the move to Everton come about? Well, I had played five years in the NWSL and after the the last World Cup, we saw how well Europe did and, and how much women's football in Europe had grown. And I think a lot of us started thinking maybe it's time for a change and, and time to push ourselves in that kind of environment. So for me, I knew that I think my time was up in the NWSL and I'd played out enough seasons there and I was ready to test myself um, and explore some new options. And The WSL was really appealing to me and I got speaking to a few teams and watching a lot of games and just kind of getting as much information as I could about that league and being in touch with Everton, speaking with Willie Kirk, the coach, uh, watching their games. It just looked like a tough, challenging environment and somewhere that I could see myself in the future. So uh, it wasn't too hard of a decision. I knew that Also, the national team coaches wanted us as players to test ourselves and kind of take ourselves out of our comfort zone. So I think 
the move to Everton for me was going to do that and was quite easy for me to decide that I think that's where I wanted to be. And you spoke about the fact that the Matildas were seeing the rise of Europe. And you guys were able to play a couple of European teams in Italy and Norway in the World Cup. What was it about playing them that was different to, I guess, the opponents the Matildas had been playing in the last couple of years? Obviously, the football in all different parts of the world is always different. But I think looking back in time, these teams weren't as good as they are now. And so to see that obviously they're playing in these professional leagues overseas and that um, constant football year round is what's developing them and and pushing them into these um, great teams that they are. Um, So we played the Netherlands before the World Cup and then, like you said, we played Norway and Italy and those three games were tough. They they were great opponents and the way they played was, uh, was excellent. So I think for us as players and for me personally, putting myself into this environment over in the UK where um, it's extremely professional and it's a full year round season um, with the with the breaks at appropriate time and just a full professional league was kind of something that that I wanted to do to help develop my game so that uh, football in Australia could grow like it had in Europe. And it's been this it's not been a, an overnight success. We've kind of seen these nations slowly over time sort of build in Europe. And as you said, European football, it's got almost a 12-month calendar um, with the ability to be able to um, build on top of that. Do you feel like having more football is good for players? Because there's also been the discussion about um playing 12 months a year with NWSL and W League and what it does for you as players mentally as well as physically? Yeah, definitely. I think this year-round professional structure is important because you're getting a lot of games in, but at the right times in the season, you're also getting the break that is important to refresh your body physically but also mentally, whereas... A lot of the girls, including myself, we were going from the NWL to the W League and we weren't getting a break. It was it was literally football 24-7. It was straight from finishing one season to starting the next pre-season or, or jumping straight into games again. So I think that is important to just refresh your mind, refresh your body um, and, and keeping yourself um, in that mindset where you know that your, your body's feeling good as, as well um, as your mind. So um, definitely important. When it comes to Everton, Australian think of one name, Tim Cahill. How did you guys connect and how did you build that friendship that, that seems to be growing? Yeah, so I think I met Tim Cahill a while back. Obviously, he's just a legend. He's, he's a legend of the game. He's an amazing person, an amazing character. And him being over at Everton... I've heard that everybody over there just loves him and, and he's an amazing person to have at the club and such a role model. So obviously living over there. So we got in touch uh, via the phone and we're just chatting and I was asking him about the club and he was telling me his thoughts and that he thought it would be a great place for me to be. And he he didn't even take much time to, to sell the club to me. It was It was just telling me about the environment, about the team, about the facilities about the staff, about the players, and, and it was easy for me to know that I think that's where I would fit into. And all of this, of course, is is about, you know, being in your best shape, your best form, your best person for the national team. And, God, what a insane couple of weeks it's been with the national team. <laughs> yeah, it's it's been crazy and everybody's trying to stay fit and healthy and in the best shape that they can with the situation that's that's unfolding but we know that it's important for us to get games in and be playing consistently and playing minutes because that's what keeps this game fit and prepares us for the tournaments so where everybody's in contact with the staff and making sure that they're getting the right programs and doing the right things in the meantime to to keep ourselves fit and prepared for when we next go into camp. Let's talk about camp because the Matildas have just come off a pretty long camp period, even though it was broken up with a, with a two-week break. Heading into January, preparing for the Olympic qualifiers, and, and at first it was going to be in, 
in Wuhan, China. <laughs> Over the next little while, the changes were made. For a player, how important was it that at the decision-making level, you guys were the ones that were put first and your safety and your health was at the forefront of that? I think that was really important because we as a playing group weren't able to make decisions about what was unfolding or what was going to happen and we were just hearing a lot of things and making up our own assumptions and thoughts about what was going on and what we thought was best but we weren't the people making the overall decision. So knowing that the FA put us first and made the appropriate decisions about our health, about our safety, to make sure that we were okay um, was great and I think we know as a group that the people that are in charge of us and making the decisions are always going to put us first and do what's best for us. So we don't have to focus on any of that. We can just focus on playing football like we do. I've always wanted to ask this question. I mean, how much of what's going on around you as a footballer sort of comes into that almost like the bubble? We do see it and we do read about it and everybody talks about it. But at the end of the day, we kind of know that we have one job and that's to focus on playing training and staying fit and making sure that we're as best prepared we can be so as much as we talk about it or think about it it's it's not actually something that we can control so for us we really shouldn't worry about it because we know that what's best for us will happen and will and those people who are looking after us will make sure that we're looked after and that comes to those olympic qualifiers because after a really long period in camp finally got to be out on the pitch and Again, it's that whole idea of being actually at home and how comfortable that was to be in familiar surroundings in terms of just being in Australia. How do you think that helped in relation to that initial tournament after everything had been so irregular, I guess? It was obviously an unfortunate situation for China especially uh, and for the Chinese national team. We did feel bad for them and, and we knew what was unfolding was a hard situation, but for us as a group there's nothing we love more than playing in Australia so when the decision came about that the games were going to be in Australia we knew that it was going to be amazing it was going to be incredible we had our fans supporting us we have the games on TV everybody's coming out it's just such a different environment such an atmosphere and I think it just pushes us that little bit that bit better knowing that we're playing for all these people in the stands and at home watching us. And I guess that's changed over the years because it used to be that you'd be playing in front of smaller crowds and now almost every time you play, you, you get big crowds, people coming out. So that changes the atmosphere. That changes, I guess, the excitement levels as well. Yeah, definitely. Like you said, we used to play in front of small numbers and as much as we were just playing for the love of the game, it was hard knowing that there weren't that many people interested in supporting you. So to come out now and walk out to packed stadiums, it completely changes the game. We know that we're inspiring people in the crowd, that people are interested in watching us and seeing, you know, what we can showcase. And it definitely pushes us that little bit more. Um, it's kind of like having a 12th man on the field with you. And that came out really in that game against China where going 1-0 down pretty late, in that game. Uh, I'm not going to lie, I was sitting on the sideline and biting every single one of my nails. Can you talk to us about what is this never say die attitude that the Matildas have and and how does that feel on the pitch when there is pressure? Because that's not the only time um, the Matildas have pulled out results when the pressure's really been on. It's funny because I knew we weren't going to lose that. And I think if you asked anybody on our team, they all would say the same thing. Uh, it doesn't matter if we go down, we do have this attitude and this, like you said, never say die mentality where we know we're going to keep fighting, we're going to push back even like it was in that game, the 90 plus minute, we'll, we'll keep fighting to get a result and it was important for us to get a result in that game. Um, we knew we needed to and when Emily scored, it was just like a sigh of relief, it was like that this is what we worked for, this is what we knew was going to happen and it doesn't really matter how good or scrappy the game is, um, we'll always fight to get a result and one that we need. How much belief and trust do you guys have in one another? Because as you said, it it's that whole idea of you can almost feel the whole playing group on the pitch, on the bench, like lift and you can hear the voices going on the pitch, lids loudest of all. What is that trust in the playing group? 
Yeah, we have a great trust um, within the group and I think we just share this bond where we want to work for each other and we want to work for Australia and it's us as players, we've worked all our lives to be in this position so we know how much of an honour it is and, and a privilege to be out there playing and we want to do ourselves proud but we want to do Australia proud and our families proud and our coaches proud at the same time. So as a group, we all work for each other, we all fight for each other and we all have that same mentality where we want to win and we want to uh, create great performances for everybody to see. Which then takes that game means that it's going to be Vietnam, um, that the Matildas will be playing off for a Olympic spot. I've spoken to you so many times about this and, and we have had some interviews about like what it means to be part of this Olympic process when you weren't the last time round, but really just expanding on that because it can be isolating when, when you're away from the playing group and, and not part of the process. So how different has 2020 been in relation to that to 2016? Yeah, it's been a complete flip around for me. I, I wasn't involved in any of the lead up to the Olympics. I wasn't involved in the Olympic qualifications and I obviously wasn't involved in the Olympics and it was really hard for me watching not only the Olympics on TV but my Australian national soccer team performing at the Olympics because I knew that I really wanted to be there. And I think we go through these periods and fluctuations of where we're performing and we're not and obviously there was a reason I wasn't in the team at that time. But for me it was just like I knew after that that I was going to work hard and get myself back into it and I wouldn't miss out on another one. So to be back with the playing group is just a dream come true for me really and I'm so happy that I'm with this group. Which kind of takes us to the fact that, you know, in your life you've had so many knocks in a way. It started off really young when you couldn't get into that Brisbane Raw team way back when because it was such a star-studded team. It was it was essentially a Matildas team at that time and you as a 15, 16-year-old trying to break into that it meant you had to leave home. Leaving home has kind of been a theme for you in your football career. I know, and it's funny because I'm somebody. I love home. So I think it puts credit to where I want to be as a footballer, the fact that I do leave home to to pursue my dreams. And it was in year 11 of school that I, like you said, couldn't crack the Brisbane Raw squad or even the Queensland Academy of Sport group. So... Um, I got an opportunity to go down to Canberra United and trial and I just packed up my bags, um, knew I'd do school by correspondence and, and headed down there. And that's kind of where I broke broke into the door of then being recognised. And a couple of years later, I came back and played for Brisbane Raw, which is where I wanted to be from the start. And things just kept progressing from there. And this football has taken me all over the world and kept me away from home a lot more than I would have liked, I guess. But I wouldn't have it any other way to play soccer, I guess. It's funny, sometimes you have to go really far away to be able to chase that dream. And I kind of had the same thing in 2010. I'd finished uni and I knew if I wanted to continue to report on women's football, well, it was at the AIS and that's where the Matildas were. And so I left Perth and moved across the country to Sydney, never been to Sydney in my life. It's a really interesting experience to be in somewhere that you don't know, you don't really know people, but you're kind of around people who have a common goal. How important was that to have a Canberra United team who you guys all had a really common goal and had an incredible year together? Yeah, obviously it made it a lot easier for me being away from home. I I was so young and and I met this group of girls that I'd, I'd never met before and I, I honestly didn't even know much about. I didn't know the Matildas group I didn't know the players I hardly knew who anybody was and it was just (laughs) like a whole new experience to me so being around these girls a lot of them took me under their wing and made me feel so comfortable and that was the season my very first season we went through undefeated and won the championship and I was like this is awesome this is where I want to be so obviously as you know I've kept playing from there and you talk about the people that took you under the wing how important the senior players of that that team you know the gray skills the caitlin munoz and ellie brush and you know michelle Heyman, um somebody who would become a longtime teammate and sally shippard just having those senior experience heads how much did you learn that year 
oh, I learned so much. This is really funny and also kind of embarrassing, but I can remember being at training and scoring against Lydia, who was in goals. And I called my mum and was like, I scored a goal against Lydia Williams. She's the Matilda's goalkeeper. And and for me, I think, oh, she saves everything. She couldn't stop a goal from this young 15, 16-year-old me. And uh, to score against her, I was like, wow, this is awesome. So I think those players and, and having those leaders really pushed me and really helped me develop I. Sally Shippard was another one who I just looked up to so much. I thought she was incredible and and she taught me a lot. Even just getting to train with her every day for me was just such an honour. So these players, when you're younger, have such a huge influence on your life and and how it kind of pans out. When did the Matilda's dream become something that you could reach out and touch? So in 2012, which was my second year in the W League, Tom Samani called me into a national team camp and I hadn't been in the youth Matildas. I I didn't go through the under 17s. I didn't go through the under 20s and I just got called into this full team camp and it was obviously so exciting for me because it was the highest peak in in Australia. But I, I went there and I didn't really know anybody and I was so young and it was so scary for me being in this environment and with all these incredible players. Um, And from there, I actually, I kind of went backwards. I then got selected for the under-20s team, so then represented the under-20s. But that was after I'd I'd already represented Australia in the full team. So my path wasn't the same as a lot of the other girls. But as soon as I went to that camp and as scary as it was, and a lot of the girls were intimidating and it was a a frightening um, um, time for me, it was one that also inspired me and I kind of knew this is, this is the Matildas, this is the Australian national team and people dream of being here and I'm actually here. So I knew that I would just keep working and drive myself to, to be an important part of that team one day, which is what I've done. So, yeah, looking back on it now, it's, it's incredible to see how far I've come. It's really interesting to hear you tell that story, that it was an environment that intimidated you, but it also was one that drove you. Where does that tenaciousness come from because we even see it in your play like sometimes I can almost see the mist come over your eyes as you get to a player where does that come from I know people say that and I've just always had this drive in me it it doesn't just relate to football but it's it's off the field too if I put my mind to something I honestly won't stop until I achieve it and it doesn't matter what that is I set goals for myself in life and and I'll keep working and doing what I need to to achieve them, whether that's, you know, moving away from home, travelling overseas. It, it doesn't matter. It's it's just the kind of person I've been raised to be and I, I quite like the drive and the determination that um, is instilled in me. How much does your family instil that and push that in you as well? Yeah, I'm really close with my family and I think they play an important part in that. It's quite funny. I have a story I remember. When I was in hospital, uh, when I was in, had moved to the rehabilitation hospital for my um, back injury and I really couldn't move and I had like a bit of rubbish and I tried to throw it from my bed into the bin and I missed. And mum wouldn't let me just leave it next to the bin. She kept giving it back to me until I got it in the bin. She was like, you know, you're not doing anything. You're just sitting in bed, like, keep going. You'll get it in the bin. And I can remember sitting in bed going like, mum, I can't. Like, I can hardly move. I can't throw this piece of rubbish into the bin. And she didn't let me stop until I did it. And I think that kind of shows a little bit of what I'm like, where I won't stop until I achieve something. And, and I guess she kind of drives that through me too. Mums are incredible. My mum's the same even though she doesn't always understand what I want to do, but she's always fully supported the decision whether she's agreed or not. And it's almost that thing of knowing even if you fail, they're kind of still going to be there cheering you on, even if they don't always believe it. Mums are incredible. And like you said, it doesn't really matter what you're doing, what you're pursuing, where your life takes you. There's one person who always support your decision, whether it be right or wrong, and that's your mum. And obviously you've seen that with your mum. I see that with my mum. And it's important to have that figure in your life who you kind of look up to and you know that they'll be there supporting you in whatever it is you choose to do in your life. Who's been your football equivalent of a mum? 
obviously I have, have a lot of close friends within the national team and within my club teams and they always listen to me. When I was first coming into the W League, so back in 2000 and when was it, 2011, and I joined Canberra United, I can remember being really close with Grace Gill and she was one of those players who did take me under her wing and she helped me a lot and she drove me a lot and she was obviously a, a big part of that Canberra United team and I was able to look up to her and see the way she played and the way she led her life and it kind of inspired me to, to live this life like she did and to keep pursuing my dreams and I know that she supported me and still to this day we still talk and I know that she's still supporting me and watching what I do in my life so I guess I could say her as that figure that when I was younger I looked up to. Yeah, she's definitely still cheerleads you on uh, on Twitter, which is so cool to see. Yeah, it's amazing. I was just thinking about 2011 and it still blows in my mind how incredibly young you were to move away from the, from the Gold Coast and go to Canberra into this environment that you knew nothing about. But I think the other thing that came through in that year was not just your pace, which was incredible, but the ribbon. We started nicknaming you Ribbon Razzo, and I'm very happy to see that that's continued. Uh, where did the ribbon come from? Back in 2011 too, I had the biggest bow. Like it was a little <laughs> bit too much. I'm so glad I've toned it down since then because it was a bit extravagant. Um, the ribbon comes from my grandma. She has always bought me the ribbons. She uh, makes sure she matches the ribbon to my kit every time and since then I've asked her just to, you know, make the the size of the ribbon a little bit smaller along the years. So I'm, I think I'm at the perfect size now where I know I'm still wearing the ribbon and she's still able to do that gesture for me where she goes out and buys them and gets to see me running around wearing them um, in important games. It must be nice almost having like a little bit of home with you wherever you are. Yeah, exactly. And as soon as I signed for Everton, within a couple of days, she had come to my house with her little bag and she had the home kit ribbon and the away kit ribbon. And it's just so special for her to be able to do that for me and for me to be able to have that part of her with me when I'm overseas or in some other part of Australia, because I know she's one that definitely misses me a lot. Not long after you ended up signing in the United States with Washington Spirit and meeting Mark Parsons. I mean, if you talk about cheerleaders, I remember in 2015, I just before the Women's World Cup ended up in Washington and Mark Parsons was absolutely glowing about you as a player. And he's almost always been really complimentary and you had a rough period after the World Cup, but he kind of took that faith, I guess, a next level when he brought you to Portland. How important was it to have sort of somebody believe in you um, in your football career at that point in time? Yeah, he really did believe in me. And I think he's played a huge part in the player I am today. I worked with him for five years and after Washington Spirit and being waived and not playing a minute at the 2015 World Cup, it was really hard for me. And he gave me that second chance by bringing me to Portland and continuing to believe in me when I felt like a lot of other people didn't. So I owe a lot to him and credit him for that. And I do think really highly of him. He, he has helped me so much. And um, I think a lot of people would say I've developed over the years by playing under him. And I guess there's been a growth in me from my first season at Portland to my last. And that is because of him. So I still talk to him now. He still watches me and I know he still has that belief and support for me. So it's amazing to have somebody like that in my life. But even during that time period, you can have somebody support you. But the honest truth is you've got to do the work. As you mentioned, that was a tough period. You didn't play a minute in 2015. You had a tough season with Melbourne Victory as well in the W League. And then, as you said, the Olympics. And, and it must have felt like just nothing was going right at that time. So how did you stay on top of everything and, and keep the faith and keep pushing and thinking, okay, it's going to turn around sometime? It was really hard. And I can remember just calling my mum and bawling my eyes out because I thought, oh, this must just be the end of my career then. Like I've been waived. I haven't played at the World Cup. Like you said, I had a bad season at Victory. It was just felt like everything was going downhill. And when I got waived from Spirit, I actually thought, well, then there's nothing else I can do now. Where, where am I going to go? Where am I going to play? What am I going to do? And I, I guess, assumed I'd just be packing my bags up and heading to Australia. And honestly, within 24 hours, I had a call from Mark and 
he said, you know, we want you to do the work and we want you to come over and we want to see this change in you. And I think within a couple of days I was on a flight and I was, I was in Portland and starting this next chapter and I just knew that if I wanted this to be my life and this to be, to be my career that I had to push myself. And from the very day I arrived at my first training session, I made the most of it. I trained as hard as I could and I kept pushing myself because I, I knew the player I was and I knew the player I could be if I just put my mind to it and worked hard. So I just spent every day doing that and I think I turned out to be all right, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> just a little bit all right. <laughs> I've met a lot of Portland Riveters and shout out to the Riveters because amazing fan group. One of the things they always said about you was just how much they felt like you put in 110%, that you worked for the team all the time. And they gave that love back. Can you describe to anybody who's, who's never seen it or never experienced it, what that Portland Thorns match experience is like? I've never experienced anything like that. The Riveters are 100% amazing. The love I felt from them, honestly, it didn't matter if I was having the worst game of my life. If we were losing, it it never stopped. The chanting, the cheering, the support was always the same. And they're absolutely incredible. You, from From the first minute to the 90th minute, they're cheering your name. They're cheering for the team. They just live and breathe this Portland Thorns team and I honestly think it changes the game because teams come to Portland and they can't match us and I honestly think it's because of that fan group because of the yelling because they know they're not being supported like we are they're incredible and I hope one day soccer in the world can have the same supporters like the Portland Thorns do. What did that time in the NWSL do for you as a person, not just the player, but as a person? Yeah, I developed so many friendships. Being over there, I my best friend is Celeste Bure, who I met uh, at the Portland Thorns, and she was the person I started living with, and I didn't know her one bit. I've, I'd never heard of her, I'd never met her, and we moved in together, and she's now my best friend. I wouldn't go a day without talking to her, even though she's on the other side of the world. So... I created some lifelong friendships. I I developed a lot as a person, as a player. I grew grew a lot off the field. I hope that I became a role model, and I think that part of my career, those those five years, was when I I really um, developed as as a person. Yeah, not only was it amazing for me football wise, but off the field and as a person, I definitely grew into the person that I am right now. And how would you describe that person today in comparison to that? 15, 16 year old back in 2011, 12? I think I'm a lot more level headed. <laughs> um, I also understand the game so much more. I, I think, you know, when I was young, I was just going out there and having fun and, and playing and, and enjoying myself. And now I really understand my role and what I'm doing on the field and, and where I want to be. I have so much drive um, for soccer and for life in general. I, you know, I have goals off the field and things I'm doing off the field in my personal life that are shaping shaping my career my life and like I said I've just grown so much and I really feel like I'm a happy and positive person and it's because I enjoy my life and I enjoy what I do so I think that's that's really important. Yeah and football can be all-consuming I mean there are times there are years that you guys might spend 150 200 days away from family and friends so how do you maintain that balance where yes you are the professional and you focus on that but also you have the ability to actually get away from the game and develop yourself and learn who you are outside of the pitch it's important to do both it's important to have you know the the soccer mindset and and that's what you do and that's your life and and that's your career but there's also the part where you need to enjoy life outside of football and you need to enjoy the time you get to spend with your family or even if that's FaceTiming, FaceTiming your family and getting to speak to them and just keep you a little bit sane in the crazy soccer world. I also study to be a paramedic. So when I'm away from football, I'm able to, you know, keep my brain ticking over, learn new things and continue to tick off subjects that I need to complete to finish my degree. So that's also a big part of my life too. And I think it's important to have the 
I guess you would say, work-life balance. How is the paramedics studying going? How much longer have you got to go? Actually going really well. I have been studying a, a fair bit recently, so just managing playing as well as doing the work I need to do. But I probably have a year and a bit left of my degree, but I do, even if it's just one subject in a trimester, I do try and keep making sure that I'm getting it done so that when my soccer career is up, I'll have that to fall back on. And that's a a passion of mine and something I'm actually excited for, knowing that when I finish playing soccer, I'll be doing my dream job. Knowing a little bit about the human body, that must have made things maybe a little bit easier, maybe a little bit harder, I don't know, when when you had the collision a couple of years ago. Just take us through that moment. Did you know what had happened? I didn't know what had happened, but I knew that it was bad because I think I'm quite a strong person and I do get thrown around on the field a bit, uh, but you'll always see me get back up. And the minute I was hit in the back, I I can't even describe how bad the pain was, but I knew that something really serious had happened. I felt like I couldn't breathe, I couldn't speak, I couldn't, I had no idea what was going on. And it was really an awful time. Even just thinking about it now, it's, I can relive it so clearly. Like I, it hasn't moved out of my memory. It's still there and I can envision exactly how I felt and what was going on. So I, I know that for me, I didn't really know what was going on and my mum back at home and the rest of my family back at home didn't know what was going on. But my mum's also a nurse, so she was probably having a lot of thoughts in her head too, watching the game about what may have happened and, if I was okay. So I think it was not only tough for me, but it was tough for everybody who was watching. And then the the period of recovery, I mean, that was the long one and, and you've spoken about it in many different ways since then. I guess the only question I want to know out of that period is how did that whole experience change you, make you stronger, make you more resilient? as a person and what did you learn about yourself and what you can endure? As I've spoken about uh, on this podcast, I put my mind to something and I always come out of it the other side, but this injury was one that tested me and I thought I actually won't come out the other side of this one. I thought this was one that would just be the end of me playing soccer and to be honest, I thought at the time too, this means I'm not even going to be able to walk again. So, you know, learning about the injury and about what it meant and what the rehabilitation process was like was tough but also comforting knowing that I would end up back to my able body full self again. But I just think once I knew that and I knew that I could come out of it the other side, it was kind of like, where I put my mind to it and was like, okay, like you can get through this and you need to get through this. You can't let it define you. So that's when I think it was when I was in the hospital bed in the rehabilitation uh, facility that I said to myself, you're, you're going to be okay and you're going to go to the World Cup and you're going to go to the Olympics. Like you have to put your mind to it and you have to do that. And I ticked off going to the World Cup. So there's just one more thing left to tick off for me and I'll um, feel quite accomplished, I think. You spoke about ticking off the World Cup. In 2019, you were able to do that in France. Describe that feeling of getting out on the pitch for your first World Cup minutes in incredible stadium and with your family watching. It was amazing. It was like I worked so hard to be there and to find out that I was starting the game as well. It wasn't just taking part, playing a couple of minutes. I actually started that game. It was incredible and I was so excited to be there and so excited to have my family watching. It was just like last World Cup I had been there and I'd watched the girls play and it was so exciting and I didn't even play. (laughs) So for me to be a part of something so big and the World Cup uh, for soccer is the biggest thing there is. It's where everyone wants to be and it's what everybody's watching. So to take part in it was just so amazing. 
And there were so many incredible moments in that World Cup. I couldn't be there to watch you girls live in person, but it was definitely lots of proud Aussie moments throughout that tournament. And there probably wasn't no prouder moment than what's been dubbed the miracle in Montpellier. How insane was that game against Brazil, particularly considering our history with them? We kind of have this rivalry with Brazil. It's it's funny. Whenever we play them, it's such a tough, brutal game. And I think this was was quite the same. But when you go behind in a game, like we spoke about before, we know that we're we're going to keep fighting and we're going to come back. And we got some goals and it might have been scrappy, but for us to come through and, and win that game was something that I think we as players knew we were going to do. But also for everybody watching, I think they kind of saw the spirit that Australia has where we'll keep fighting and we'll keep working. And it was an important win on our road to to making it further in the tournament. And I mean, I know that it ended short and it ended before we would have liked, but it did help us um, make it through to those quarterfinals. You guys are a group that's been together for a a long time now. Um, A lot of the core, either at W League level or Matilda's level or young Matilda's level, you've, you've kind of all grown up together. How has that been to have this group of girls to sort of navigate that maturing process alongside experiencing the same experiencing the same firsts alongside each other and even just the life moments alongside each other we all have kind of gone through this whole period together and a lot of us are around similar ages and it's where that bond in our team comes from and it's also yeah sharing firsts with each other and I think I debuted alongside uh Steph and Alana and Alana yeah so to still be here in this team with them now it's it's amazing thinking that we debuted in 2012 together in the same game and then we went to the 2019 World Cup together so many years later it's amazing going through this journey with them and having you know my closest friends as my teammates and these people that I get to share my journey with. What are you looking forward to in the future with the girls? I think we want to create history and whether that be at the next Olympics or the next World Cup or the Olympics after that, we I think it's about time we that's get a medal at the, the Olympics or place at the World Cup. We want to win tournaments and we want to show the rest of the world how good Australia really is. We've got um, such a good group at the moment and we want to perform well but we also want to inspire the next group of girls coming through. We want to be role models for these players and through, but also, you know, young, young girls who this will be their future. It's not just young girls, which is the amazing thing that's happening right now. You know, there was that great photo. I saw that young man who came to one game and then came to the next game to see you again. And he's wearing a 16 Razzo jersey. It's young boys who are seeing women as role models, seeing women performing phenomenal athletic feats and it's become so normal how does the role model mantle sit for you I think I really aspire to be a role model for me seeing that young man at the game and him holding up a sign asking for my boots and him coming back you know game after game I look at it and I think wow he he's looking at me and he's inspired and I feel like as a player I want to inspire people but also as a person and who I am Mm. and I make sure that I always have time to give back to the fans and give and give back to the people who are are coming out and supporting us and I think you can see that in me whether that's you know with the national team with my club or or overseas I want these young people boys girls to look up to me and say I want to be like her I, I want to be a player like that I want to be a person like that and I think as athletes it's important for us to be role models and to inspire future generations. And it's all come on so quickly we've spoken about 2015 and I was just looking at photos the other day and seeing the send-off game for the Rio 2016 Olympics and in Ballarat there was I think about 3,000 people at the game and then go to the Olympic qualifiers in Newcastle and there's 14,000 people at the game and there are people coming from everywhere in Australia. How does this moment in women's football feel for you and did you 
ever think we'd kind of get to this place when you when you first started out in the the national team? I don't think I even thought it could develop into what it has now. To see where it's at is just so amazing and to think that there was only 3,000 people there and now there's the packed out stadiums and so many people coming to watch us. I just think, imagine in another number of years, imagine in, in another five years, 10 years, what it's going to be like if it keeps growing the way it has. It's incredible to think that the next group of Matildas coming through will have even more people there to support them and I think that's why it's important that we lead the way and keep growing the game so that more people do get inspired to come and watch the next group of of Matildas coming through. 2023, a Women's World Cup in Australia on home soil. You spoke about what it was like, you know, how amazing it was when it was France and you were running out onto the pitch, uh, walking out onto the pitch um, to represent Australia. For you as a player, can you imagine even what 2023 would be like at home in front of everyone? I think that's something that we as players dream of, having a a major tournament like the World Cup in Australia and you see the amount of fans that come out to support us at friendly games at these most recent golden games and just to think about how many people would come out to a World Cup game, to World Cup, the, the finals games, just imagining the atmosphere and the support we would get and to even just think that this is our country, this is who we're representing, the the jersey we're wearing, how much pride we have in what we're doing and it's for all of the people who are sitting around you watching you in the stadium or at home on the TV. It's just a thought that all of us have and I don't know if we would be able to explain how happy we would be if the 2023 World Cup was in Australia. Hayley, you've been a professional football player for almost a decade now. <laughs> I know it seems crazy, but it's been that long already. <laughs> hey, if you're old, don't even get me started. <laughs> Looking back now in hindsight, what would you have liked to have told 15-year-old Haley about where she would be in 10 years and what lessons she would learn and what should she do in terms of taking in the journey that she's about to go on? I think it would be just to enjoy it, enjoy the ride and it's going to be a roller coaster. There's going to be the highs, the lows, the ups, the downs. And I think I've had my fair share of, of highs and lows. And it's amazing to see where I'm at now and to think back to when I was a young girl, I don't think I could have envisioned that, that this is where I'd be. And, you know, I would have been to World Cups and been to major tournaments and be playing overseas and be inspiring um, young people all over the world. So... I think I just tell myself to enjoy it, to to stay motivated, to make sure that whatever you believe you can achieve, no matter what people tell you along the way, whether they believe in you or not, that if you put your mind to it, you'll be able to chase that dream that, that you want to chase. Now to finish off the podcast, I'm going to ask a set of 11 questions called the Fast 11. And I'm going to ask everyone this over the next little while who's on the, the Westville Matildas podcast. So are you ready for them? Yes, I am ready. Okay, let's do this. What do you consider your best personal trait? I would say resilience. I think just whenever I've been knocked down, I've been able to get back up and basically achieve whatever I put my mind to. What do you consider your worst personal trait? I would say, I guess, a bit of worry and stress. I feel like when I don't have things planned out, I start to worry myself or or if I have a, a decision that needs to be made, I sit on it for, for so long not knowing what the right thing to do is and I, I get worried and stressed that I won't make the right decision. So I think I'm going to go with that. What is your perfect idea of happiness? I think happiness to me would be being with my family, feeling loved, playing soccer, becoming a paramedic, getting married, having a family, having kids. I think being around my friends, just kind of like the life you dream of when you're younger, just ticking all those things off um, and being fulfilled. What is your greatest fear? I fear not having my family and I, I don't even like to really think about it because 
I'm just so close with them all that I can't imagine my life without them. What's your most treasured possession? (laughs) Probably my phone. But the reason that is because it has all my photos on it and I think if I had lost my phone or it went into the ocean or whatever, I wouldn't have the photos of my life and my family and my friends and all the things I've done in my life. And I think those are the things we look back on and, and basically treasure knowing that we can look back and see those moments and see those photos of times that made us happy or sad, whatever it may be. Well, I hope to goodness you're backing them up like every day. I'm not really good at the whole technology, iCloud thing, so I might need to get some tips from you about that. Yeah, let's have a chat after this, okay? (laughs) (laughs) Which words or phrases do you most overuse? In everyday life, I'm not so sure, but I know that when I'm doing interviews, I always say obviously or definitely, and I'm when I go back and watch the interview, I'm like, why did you say that after every single question? Like, say something different. Well, there are a couple in this one, so I can... I, can I know, it's probably, honestly, it's, it's probably after every question you've asked, I've probably said one of those words. Well, we'll count it for later, or we can get the listeners <laughs> to count it and tell us what the score was on that. Oh, great. If you could go back to relive one football moment, what would it be and why? It would be my return game to the Matildas after my back injury, running on the field, scoring that goal just brings me so much emotion and was just like I finally made it and I'm finally back doing what I love. So that was one to remember for sure. What moment would you like to wipe out of your memory forever? That's easy too. I think the moment that I broke my back. Which footballer, past or present, do you most identify with? Sawa from the Japanese national team. I'm like a little bit obsessed with her. I just think she is amazing. She's a legend of the game. She's such a leader. When I played for Cambria United and we went over to the club championships, uh, I watched her play and met her and actually got a photo with her and I just think she is so incredible as a player and as a person off the field. Okay, people can't really see this, but I think I just mouthed shut the front door because I I adore Hamaru Sawa so much. Oh, I, I know. And just like I didn't know soccer all that well, but something about her, especially like going over there and seeing her, I, she's just the best. How have we never had this conversation? I met her in 2014 in Vietnam and the people from what was formerly the women's game who were with me, they can tell you I literally could not talk at all when that I met her. so good. I and love that. I'll have to get up my old photos and find this photo from when I was really young that I have with her. It's probably pretty funny and I was probably like a little bit too excited to meet her. (laughs) Okay, you just said the one word that would derail the fast 11, so well done there. (laughs) I think I might know the answer to this one, but what profession other than football would you like to try? Paramedicine, obviously, studying to be a paramedic. So when I finish my football, I will be a paramedic. Finally, at the end of your football playing career, what would you like fans and writers and people like me to say about you, Hayley Razzo? I think I would like for them to remember me and say about me that I'm a, a fearless player, one who gives 110% every time she plays, but also really important to me that I was a role model and I inspired young people, other players and, and young children all over the world to, to chase their dreams and be motivated and be determined and uh, achieve their goals. So I think that's what I'd want people to say about me. I can't speak to everyone, but I would say you're, you're pretty much on the way there. So thanks very much for giving up some time to chat with us on the Westfield Matildas podcast. We really, really appreciate it. And we've all seen your journey. We've all been inspired at times by you. And it was great to, for you to stop by and have a, a much longer chat. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And that was Westfield Matilda's forward, Hayley Razzo. That's the end of the interview. Thanks so much for joining us for the last little while. 
This podcast will be part of a Matilda series that I look out for over the next couple of weeks. There's so much more information also on the Matilda's channels. That's either matildas.com.au or you can have a look at the social channels and all those links are on matildas.com.au. You can also have a listen to another national team podcast, which is the Socceroos podcast. And you can also check that out at socceroos.com.au. Thanks very much for joining us and we'll see you next time. Bye.